Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Um, my name is Mara. I'm the Workshops and Education Coordinator here at NYC Parks Green Thumb. We are the part of the New York City Parks Department that works with over 550 community gardens across the city. I'm excited to be here with my colleagues, Eric and Adder, who will be helping um, with Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout um, the presentations today, you can put them in the chat and we will ask them out loud. Um, we on today's panel, we have um, Matt Drury from who's the uh, director of government relations at NYC Parks. We have Sarah McCollum Williams, who is the executive director of Green Gorillas, and we have Robert Atterbury, who wears many hats, is a community gardener with extensive experience working for city council members and accessing discretionary funding as a gardener. So I'm going to um, start by sharing my screen. And I think I need to switch these. All right. Can one of my co-hosts confirm that you can see the correct screen and not the presenter view? OK, so we did the um, brief introductions. And Matt, hello. Can we get a quick sound check? Check one, two, check one, two. Beautiful. Thank you. OK. Um, so we're going to talk briefly about like what we mean um, when we're talking about discretionary funding and how it works and what the timeline is and expense versus capital and all of that. And then we're going to have 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, although if there's any like urgent clarifications, then my colleagues Eric and Adder can interrupt. Um, so if you're just tuning in, welcome. My name is Mara. I'm the Workshops and Education Coordinator here at NYC Parks Green Thumb. Um, this workshop is being offered with Spanish interpretation, so if you would like to participate in that, you can click the interpretation icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please put all questions in the chat. My colleagues Eric and Adder will ask them out loud. So what is discretionary funding? It's funding from elected officials that can be given towards either city agencies like us, like Green Thumb, which is part of NYC Parks, or eligible nonprofits for community projects like Green Gorillas. Um, capital funding are large scale projects. They're projects that cost um, more than $50,000 and represent a comprehensive betterment. Um, the nuance that uh, Matt shared with me is that you can't pay $50,000 for a bench, but it could be $50,000 for like a whole seating area that everyone can enjoy. Um, the project should be in place for more than five years. And common examples in Green Thumb Community Gardens include fence installation, on-site water installation, and sidewalk reconstruction. Um, capital funding is only for city agencies like NYC Parks. Um, expense funding is anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000. And examples might include garden supplies, tools, compost bins, benches, lumber for specialty projects, like a lot of different things. Um, and the money can go to either a city agency or an eligible nonprofit who must be able to actually front the money and get reimbursed later. Um, awards are specific to a fiscal year, whereas the um, capital funding might extend a, a few years. These are just some photos of some common Green Thumb Capital projects. The first one is fencing. You can see the before and after at Jane Street Garden in the West Village. Really nice improvements. Um, On-site water installation, so that the garden group no longer has to access the water using a fire hydrant, um, but I can actually have a spigot inside the garden. And sidewalk installation. And here's where I'm going to pass the mic to Matt. Sure. Hi, everybody. Great to see everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, and kudos uh, to everyone for, for coming together. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about some of the funding streams that are out there and available uh, from, from your uh, local elected officials. Um, you know, they, they get referred to in a lot of different ways, discretionary funding, uh, but, I'll, but I'll break it out into two uh, sort of, you know, so given the, what, what you kind of heard about, you know, what, what constitutes capital uh, funding or capital work versus what doesn't, you know, with that in mind. 
Uh, so in general, uh, local elected, local city elected officials, namely uh, the borough president and council members, have access to essentially an annual allocation. They are granted uh, through various negotiations at each adopted budget. They're essentially granted authority to go ahead and allocate or nominate, uh, you know, a set of of capital funding that they kind of have year to year. Um, and it works out to this. This changes because there are formulas and things that get a little squirrely. Uh, but um, each borough president has roughly 20 million access to, and then the council member usually ends up, each council member uh, ends up with about five to six million uh, that they can allocate. And this can, you know, and, and, and you know, at the end of the day, and we can talk about this, you know, uh, a little later on during Q&A, but, you know, because construction gets more and more expensive, that, that, that money doesn't go as far as any of us would like. And I think a lot of your local elected officials express some frustration that, you know, they want to support five, six, seven different projects, but with, you know, with a fairly limited pool of funding, you know, they, they, they have to make some tough choices. So there's some constraints there. Uh, and anyhow, and, and complicating that a little bit further is that uh, some council members, roughly a little more than half, usually route a portion, they sort of set aside a portion of that capital funding every year and put it through a very public facing what they call participatory budgeting which where they, you know, they recruit local delegates and they engage in uh, local uh, sort of conversations and they actually build a, a ballot with, with projects and then the public actually votes. It's like I don't know, Mass Singer or American Idol, what have you. Um, and so there's actual direct public feedback about, you know, potential, and that helps, that helps route uh, some of the funding that a council member has access to, um, which is an interesting sort of, you know, sort of ancillary parallel. Uh, but then they also just make general allocation decisions you know, regarding the rest of their their uh, kitty, if you will, uh, for the rest of, of that season. Uh, council specifically also has access to expense funding, which is to say non-capital uh, work. It is a smaller dollar amount, usually roughs out, you know, roughly half a million dollars every year. And this can go towards things that are, you know, don't have to be uh, capitally eligible. Supply, purchasing supplies, uh, hiring staff, theoretically, uh, vehicles, in some cases, small vehicles. Um, and so, uh, th that's out there uh, in terms of allocations that can be made that that and we can get we'll get to this in a little bit, but that funding, you know, can be directed both towards city agencies, uh, as well as third party nonprofits, but I believe we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so the overall timeline with Green Thumb Community Gardens is we encourage you to meet with your outreach coordinator first and discuss your plans, your ideas, your goals, what you're hoping to have purchased for your garden. Um, and that way we can help um, share what the process is gonna look like and what's feasible and like on what timelines um, and such things like that. Um, Green Thumb also does its own internal advocacy for discretionary funding. And so we wanna make sure that what we're advocating for aligns with what you guys actually need. So it's always good to meet with your outreach coordinator. Um, generally during the garden season is fine. And then the garden group can actually um, urge their local representative to fund projects at the garden. So you guys can, and we encourage you definitely to build relationships with your local electeds. Um, and then the budget isn't announced until June or July. And then the actual specific funding awards, you may not find out that your garden group actually received funding until the following January or February. And then we're on like a very tight timeline to buy everything before the June 30th deadline. Um, in terms of um, just the process for nonprofits, Sarah will go into this a little bit more, um, but some nonprofits like Green Gorillas are approved to also accept expense funding, not capital funding, um, and can meet with the reps, advocate, apply, and receive an award as well. The deadline for next year hasn't actually been announced yet, um, but is usually in mid-February sometime. The capital process takes a few years, so it's a bit longer. Um, and this is like a general overview of what that usually looks like. And again, these are projects that are over $50,000 and that are things like in-ground water, um, fencing and sidewalks. So there's a few months for initiating the project. Design can take up to a year or longer. Procurement buying things, um, sometimes that takes seven to 10 months. Sometimes it could take longer in construction. 
Um, depending on the size and scale of the project, this might be an overestimate. It might not take a year to 18 months. It might take less time, but altogether, um, this is about how long these projects take. And these are some links that I will put in the chat of how to find your community board, your city council member, all of these resources and people who you can advocate with just to get to know the garden better, what your goals are, what you're hoping to achieve, um, and what you might need funding for. Anything you might add to that, Matt? Uh, no, no, I think that's very well said. All right, thank you. Um, then Sarah, the mic is yours next. Great. Um, hi, everyone. And I'm really happy to be here with you. Uh, if it's okay, Mara, I'll share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, great. Um, just wanted to start off by sharing a little bit about Green Gorillas for those of you who um, may not be familiar with us. We've been um, uh, serving New York City since uh, 1973, so we're getting ready to celebrate our 50th anniversary next year. Um, and we work to advocate for and support community gardens across the city. Um, just highlighting here uh, to share some of um, the things that are values for us and areas of focus for us. Um, uh, in terms of values, our core values are um, an exchange of wisdom about nature, food, and land between generations. So we're really interested in intergenerational relationships, um, climate justice, food sovereignty, community land use and access, and then economic initiatives rooted in community action, service, and health. And we express those values through focusing on particular projects and particular areas like connecting gardeners with resources, which uh, today's conversation is really um, revolving around is how to connect gardeners with more resources. Um, we also focus on empowering youth, building coalitions, um, and um, advocating for gardens. Um, so I wanted to share a few examples of applying for and receiving discretionary funding. Um, and here's just a map, oops, sorry. Here's just a map of, um, the different council districts that Green Gorillas um, had discretionary funds from um, during, um, sorry, this is actually for fiscal 2022. So this is actually the last fiscal year. Um, so we had received uh, funding from council member Ayala, uh, Kristen Richardson Jordan, Althea Stevens, uh, Chio Se. Carlina Rivera, um, Perina, Anna Sanchez, and Julie Wan. And I put in parentheses the previous council member because, and um, I'm sure this is something that Robert will talk a little bit about, but we've seen so much change in the city council um, over the last year. The most recent election cycle, I think brought us 32 new council members out of the total 51 or 52. Um, so there are a lot of new council members, a lot of new relationships um, to uh, be working on fostering. Um, and then here are um, some examples of some of the things that we were able to do with those discretionary funds. So we, in district two, um, we worked with the 11th Street Community Garden, which is a Manhattan Land Trust garden, to help them secure some lumber, gravel, and mulch, and then other supplies for rebuilding a seating area. There had been a tree that fell over in that area um, that had to be removed, that destroyed part of it. Um, so it was pretty important uh, to be able to help them rebuild that area for community use. Um, and we were fortunate to be able to use funds from 
council member Rivera to be able to purchase the supplies um, that were needed for the garden members to uh, gather around and, and to rebuild that area. Um, and a totally different example is uh, work that we've done with the Hattie Carthen uh, Community Garden in Bed-Stuy in District 36. And here you can see um, this is a big community event um, where community, this is, this is an Earth Day event um, where community members are welcomed to come into the garden um, to plant seeds. Um, and there's a sort of group community seed planting activity. And we were able to purchase the seeds, the seed trays, um, the potting soil um, to be able to help to support this event that the garden was doing. Um, on a slightly bigger scale, we also worked with um, Farmer Jan, she's there in the middle there, um, on a slightly bigger project, which was to kind of re, um, redesign and re-equip their children's garden area. So you see her there in the like low fenced area that's, you know, um, that was soon to be planted by children um, and, you know, focus on really welcoming kids into the community. So that's another example, very different than supplying the seeds um, and seed trays and soil, but this was really equipping a garden, you know, an area uh, for use uh, by the youngest members of the community. Um, we've also used discretionary funds to hold giveaways of seedlings, um, and and seeds and here's an example of the seed trays and typically what we try to do during those giveaways is not just give away the seedlings but also to give away seeds um, oftentimes to hold a workshop at the same time or some other um, community gathering have food uh, drinks conversation um, time to talk about resources and share resources between community gardeners, sometimes uh, distribute small hand tools or packets of compost. Um, so these are things that, this is a way that we can help to serve, you know, lots and lots of different gardens within a particular district, um, as opposed to focusing on one particular like big project like we did here um, in the Hattie Carthen Garden. Um, and then also here we have a image of uh, mushroom kits that we purchased for uh, workshops and educational purposes. So if a gardener, um, you know, came to us and said, oh, we would really want to hold a workshop on growing mushrooms or on garlic or whatever the case may be, we can purchase enough supplies for them to do that um, and welcome in the community, welcome in other community gardeners for that. Um, and uh, also, and here's just another example of like purchasing things that might help to provision, um, you know, a children's area within the garden in a shady spot in the garden. Um, so these are just, you know, from like larger scale projects, um, uh, including, you know, kind of like redesigning a whole area of a garden uh, or rebuilding an area of a garden, like the seating area. Um, the, all the way down to purchasing seeds. So there are a really big range of things that can be provisioned through um, discretionary funds. Um, and as uh, Mara was sharing, nonprofit organizations um, are um, able to access funds to benefit garden groups um, in addition to city agencies. So nonprofits like Green Gorillas um, and other nonprofit organizations uh, can apply for discretionary funds in February. Um, and usually that application comes as like the culmination of a process of speaking with the council member, speaking with gardeners in the district, um, un understanding what is needed, um, what types of projects um, uh, would benefit uh, that particular district. So that, that, application process is just like one small part along the way um, and one small part of the overall conversation. Um, and 
make sure I didn't skip anything. So I wanted to just share a little bit like behind the behind the scenes, like why why nonprofit organizations um, are able to access these funds and sort of how um, they go about accessing these funds. Uh, one facet is staff capacity that um, securing and administering these, this funding requires a tremendous amount of time and effort and sometimes uh, very specific training or specific skills. Um, and um, as both Matt and Mara um, shared, there's also um, a whole process where the nonprofit organization has to actually become a vendor of the city. Um, so it's it's a it's a it's a process that involves a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of time, a lot of energy going into it. Um, and then there's also a lot of, um, in terms of administering the funding, the other facet of it is that since these contracts operate on a reimbursement basis, um, whatever organization uh, is that is administering the funds has to outlay the funds, has to spend the funds first. And then after the fiscal year concludes, then they can apply to have those funds reimbursed. So it also requires that an organization has enough funding to be able to spend whatever that amount is, $10,000, $5,000, and then wait across time for the city to then reimburse for that. Um, another facet of this is, is really like building relationships across networks. So in terms of presenting um, a project to a city council member, sometimes going to the council member and presenting a group of projects is more compelling than asking for support for just one. So, if, you know, for us, for example, if we're able to say, oh, you know, these five gardens are looking to do these five projects or, you know, this, these three different things across this year, that can be a little bit more compelling to them than just one request. So we're able to kind of um, as a nonprofit organization, be able to uh, work across district, across the whole district to, um, you know, uh, be able to share multiple projects. Um, and then there's also a facet of the, you know, the importance of ongoing outreach and relationship building with the elected officials to build visibility for funding needs, but also to invite them to things, to thank them for things. Um, and those that that you know any anything along the way, um, it 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 go it helps a lot, um, and uh, it's really important to have that ongoing relationship, not just a can you please give me this funding <laughs> relationship, but to make sure they're invited to things, make sure that they're thanked for things, um, and uh, that that takes a lot of energy and effort, and especially. Um, this year, as all of the new council members have, you know, um, taken their roles, uh, you know, there's just been a new, an entirely new group of relationships that need to be built. Um, let's see. I wanted to just also quickly share a couple of um, just tips uh, for pitching projects to elected officials. And it might not even be pitching the project, but just, just making them aware of the needs that are happening within your, um, within your garden. Um, the first thing is to really, and this is like after you speak, you know, Mara was sharing that the first step is really to talk with your outreach coordinator, strategize with them, work together with them. Um, and then once that happens, then, you know, to call or email your council member's office, um, you can request a meeting um, or a phone call. Uh, you can let them know that you're a constituent, you know, say, I, I live in the district. Um, I am the steward of a community garden here. Let them know how long your garden has been serving the district, how long you've been involved in the garden, what types of activities the garden does that support the community. 
um, whether that's growing food, community events, uh, environmental benefits, let them know what it is that the garden is doing to serve the community and explain your community garden's needs. Uh, so get to the point of like, what is the, what is the need? What issue um, would this project address? What resources do you need in order to address that? And then talk about why that's important. Why is that thing essential? Why, what will be the impact on the community if the council member is able to assist um, with funding that particular project? Um, and, you know, this is something that can happen across, you know, I would say you might even be able to accomplish this in like three or four sentences or a couple of bullet points. Making it short is really important um, and making it really, really direct. So who are you? Uh, what are you doing? What is the project? What resources do you need? And what will the impact be? Um, and uh, that can then help and let them know also if you're working together with, you know, you could mention I'm working together with my outreach coordinator at Green Thumb, or I'm working together with Green Gorillas on this, or I'm working together with Grow NYC on that. So let them know who else you're in conversation with and that you are, you do have a broader base of support and folks who are also involved in helping to solve the, the problem or to, um, you know, uh, bring about funding and resources for the project. Um, I wanted to just share also that um, you're very welcome to reach out to us. Um, and if it's possible for us, you know, we don't have relationships with every city council member, uh, but we do have relationships with some and we're happy to share meeting time or resources or to make introductions. Um, or to include and specifically mention your garden needs when, whenever we're in conversation with electives and making a uh, request to elected. So if there's something that we can do to help to elevate your needs um, in the garden, we're happy to do that. Um, and just lastly, wanted to thank you all for your work, uh, which is just like so crucial, uh, incredibly important um and is certainly under resourced so the more that we can all share the importance of increased resources for community gardens um the better and however we can work together as a unit on that in our different ways from our different perspectives um let's continue that let's continue that work um and uh happy to continue in this conversation with um, any of you, all of you, folks from Green Thumb, other folks from the city. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really, really helpful information. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Robert. Robert, the mic is yours to share a bit about your experiences um, with discretionary funding. Um. Hi, um, so I'm Robert Atterbury. I'm with uh, Hooper Grove Community Garden in Williamsburg. Um, and I uh, have worked um, up until earlier this um, beginning of this year, I worked for about 12 years for elected officials on the city and federal level. Um, now I'm over at Hudson River Park, um, uh, which is the Piers and West Side of Manhattan, where we too also seek discretionary money from our council members. Um, I think we've, we got about $600,000 this year, which is, um, you know, solid for us. Um, you know, a lot of small projects. Um, so I think um, Sarah touched on some of the really great pieces of how to. Um, what to say when you're actually engaging with the elected officials. Um, but I actually want to take it back before then, because as she did kind of mention, you don't want your ask to just be the first ask, first time they're meeting you, for you to be hands out asking for money. Um, and so I think um, for Hooper Grove, um, we successfully got um, our council member, then council member Antonio Renoso, now Manhattan, our Brooklyn Borough president, um, we were able to work with his office to do it because we actually started our relationship with his office um, well before that, years before we actually got the money. Um, it was when we first started organizing to turn what was then uh, uh, HPD Housing Preservation Development lot into a garden um, and get it transferred into the Parks Department. We reached out to his office and included them 
in some of our initial planning meetings, in uh, they got copies of our letters of support when we were going to the community board, when we were building institutional support, we actually went and met with them about our plan and our intents um, and included them sort of every step of the way and kept their, his office up to date on the development of the garden from sort of really its inception. Um, I think that that was ultimately the piece that was able to help us get over the hump was that his office, by the time we got around to asking for money for things, his office was very, very familiar with who we are, what we were doing, what we were trying to do. Um, we'd spent a lot of time um, providing that support um, so that they were comfortable with us um, and were able to really know and acknowledge the great work we were doing. A lot of people, and I think, um, to their testament, do this work without, just because it's good work to do, um, without really the goal of building on it. Um, but keeping up the good communication with your elected officials is, um, at a ha is a habit I would encourage you guys all to get, um, uh, to sort of develop. Um, our Hooper Grove right now, we have taken on, we've sort of launched a tree pit project um, in our local community. We've done, I think we're up to 35 tree pits on all the surrounding blocks, working with local homeowners. Um, and along the way, I we've sent regular updates to our elected officials, both our council member, uh, a story, our state senator and assembly member to talk about, oh, just FYI, if you see these things on these blocks, um, this is a project we're doing, we're planting them with native plants, we're partnering with the uh, people, homeowners to help show them how to care for their tree pits. Um, and to build that ongoing relationship so that they know as we do things, rather than trying to come in and say, here's two years worth of history, here's five years worth of history all at once. Um, Cause it's really developing a long-term relationship. Um, and I would encourage you not, I would encourage you to think about your elected officials as tools um, because they can do so much more um, and be so much more helpful than just actually discretionary funding. Um, and it is a good way to help them. If you were having rat problems, they can help connect you to the Department of Health. If you are having um, other, you're having problems and you can't seem to get the right answer from any city agency, sanitation, um, even the Parks Department, although you should always start with your coordinator, um, even the Parks Department, um, they can help cut through red tape um, and get you attention that you might not otherwise get from city agencies. Um, and so my sort of three steps um, that I would mention are sort of like one, be known. So you should be known to your elected officials before you go and ask for money. Um, you have to, should make an ask. And as Sarah said, it needs to be a clear ask. You have to have an intent and an understanding of the impacts. Um, and then you have to follow up um, because simply making an ask and sending one email and asking for a meeting and then never following up if they, you don't hear back or go, time goes on or you do have the meeting and it's been six months and you don't hear back from them, um, you have to do a lot of the legwork. Um, elected officials have a lot of lot of groups in their uh, communities vying for their attention. Um, and so it is really helpful for you if you're able to take on some of that legwork of, oh, when should I follow up and then actually do so um, at a reasonable time and like keep that, uh, that ongoing relationship alive um, and communication is very helpful. If you are present in their mind, um, you are more likely to float to the top of the list um, of requests because they you are competing against for discretionary money. You're competing against senior centers and schools and PTAs and other parks. Um, every community organization that you know, um, you're kind of competing against um, about uh, tenant tenant help, uh, housing preservation. Like you are you are in a large pot of this money um, about a lot of really good causes. Um, and so you have to be present enough that they are familiar with your impact in the community to do it. Um, and I think there are, Sarah talked about some of the ways I will say for elected officials, um, we invite our elected officials to all our major events. We make sure their offices know about it. They don't often come, um, but simply inviting them like puts it on their radar that you will have events, that you have this public engagement. Um, we have, when we have a movie night, when we uh, do pumpkin carving, when we do our annual sort of like fundraiser, plant raiser, um, we invite them. Um, you asking for help is a good way for them to know you. If you are looking for help with rat, if you have street trash problems that you're doing cleanups on or that you want help with sanitation trying to address something, um, that's a good way to do it. Um, advocacy on other topics. Um, and this is where I will 
depart slightly from some of our other institutional partners. And I will say, um, I actually think that fair criticism of elected officials or um, direct advocacy is an okay way to build a relationship. Um, commenting on other legislation that's going through the city council, commenting on uh, things that you like or don't like, as long as it is fair and reasonable and not even professional, but um, uh, grounded in uh, facts and not personal. I would never say, don't ever do, it's not personal attacks, you're not yelling at them, you're not berating them, you're not, um, you know, uh, spreading the bad word about them, but advocating for good things. Um, one of the ways we actually built a relationship with our local assembly member was when there was a um, bill going through Albany about uh, reducing plastic bag usage in New York State. Um, and we started early with it as part of uh, a coalition. We signed on one of the major trash that we spent a lot of time picking up from our sidewalks is plastic bags. They are caught in our trees, street trees. Um, and so we started advocating with her office to say we would like her to support it. Um, she ultimately didn't that year. And we followed up to say that we were disappointed. Um, but in that exchange, staff had to respond to us and it gave us an opening to talk about some of the other things we were doing. Um, and there is some, some favor trade where it, I think it made them more interested in being helpful us down the road because we had a fair disagreement with them on, on a topic. Um, and I think that that is a totally fine way, as long as you're able to do so in a calm, collected, even-handed engagement. Um, and I would also say, when you talk to them, a lot of these relationships will be with staff members for elected officials. And you shouldn't be afraid to talk about staff. You shouldn't be insulted that you're talking to a staff member. Staff do a vast majority of the work for elected officials. They are the ones who are going to sort your applications first. They're the ones who are going to vet your applications, uh, which ones even make it to the council member's desk at all, never mind trying to help prioritize. Um, there will be more staff members in the room when their decisions are being made about who's getting funded. There will be elected officials. There is one council member and there'll be probably two to three people from staff sitting there helping them go through it. Um, so it's important to have those staff relationships. Um, and we, we the folks talked about the councils turned over, elections happen, people win, they lose. Um, you should always be starting new relationships. Um, and in with that, I will say, a lot of staff are forever. Like elected officials may change. Some of your community elect your community staff members, particularly if your elected officials were allied beforehand, will carry straight through. We've had the same liaison in my for my community board um, since I believe two council members ago. Um, they, they, he, he's wonderful. He survived from Diana Reyna through Antonio to us. Um, and that is, um, so keeping those relationships, they also move on. Our former chief of staff is now, who was a liaison for our council member, became Antonio's chief of staff, who is now council member. Um, political offices, elected offices are a community onto themselves um, that you are looking to engage in um, as part of this. Um, and my other final, kind of final piece of this is with your ask, follow up in writing. Always, always write your goal. What are you, what are you looking for? Why are you looking for it? What are you asking your elected council member to do or your elected official to do, your assembly or state senator to do? Um, Pre-write that email before you go into a meeting or before you get on the phone. So as soon as you hang up, you can do a very quick edit to reflect what you've talked about and then send it to them in writing. Um, because they, again, spend all day answering phones and you might get lost in their, you know, I have my notepad of which I keep all of my work notes. Um, but if I turn the page and lose something, um, uh, I may be lost forever in the way that I can always dig through my emails. Um, so those are generally my face. Um, don't be afraid to speak up and ask for help from your elected officials. You should always be afraid, okay to ask for help. You, they are there, their job is to help people through these processes. Um, their staff are happy to do so. Um, they like the engagement. Elected officials are looking to be out in the community and all of us in community gardens are the community. You represent your community, you represent your neighbors, you engage your neighbors. Um, and so you have something to really offer and bring to the for the elected officials to engage with, um, as long as you are including them as part of it. That's 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 what I got. Amazing, thank you. That was great. Um, so, folks, we are going to move into Q and A question and answer. 
So if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please go ahead and add them to the chat. And my colleagues, Eric and Adder, are going to read them out loud for our panelists. Eric, what is our first question? Okay, well, thank you so very much. Uh, this was just un unbelievable uh, from the panelists. You've just condensed years and years and years of community contact with electeds in just a very few moments in under an hour. I really wanna thank each of you for the, the um, insight that you brought, uh, Matt, Robert, and, and Sarah. Um, I have one question here, the first one uh, right off the bat, and Matt, this is gonna be into your wheelhouse here. Uh, this comes from Ms. Uh, Casa Pella, and her question is, uh, can discretionary funds be used for other funding outside of capital projects, such as soft costs? Yeah, it's a great, that's a great question. So, and 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 I'll I'll provide a response. And and if I you know feel free to circle back with a follow up question if I if I've misinterpreted, um, I, I would uh, quickly just kind of just quickly recharacterize. It, maybe it'll just be helpful for thirty seconds if I just quickly define sort of capital spending versus uh, expense spending. So basically, you know, as 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 Mara mentioned earlier, capital funding is um, actually bond funded. It's essentially the city borrowing uh, money. You are, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars for, you know, big capital improvements, streets, uh, you know, new buildings, uh, facilities, things of that nature. So those are, those are, you know, that's capital uh, reconstruction. Um, expense funding is uh, tax uh, levy based. So it's a year to year budget that changes depending on what the city is receiving through revenue, taxes, what have you, versus what it expen expects to spend, you know, salary. So, so city employee salaries, that's all expense funding. Uh, supplies, you know, paper, folders, what have you, right? Like th that's all expense funding. Um, so that's sort of just the two kind of buckets of, you know, civic, you know, funding options that are out there essentially. So uh, discretionary funds uh, can be, you know, that run through elected officials. They have access to both capital funding, which can be directed to city agencies, not, not external. Uh, I know we've talked a lot about external third parties, but only city agencies are, are with with very there are a few like minor exceptions that I that have to go through the speaker's office that I'm that, that you know I'm not even sure that's happened in years but but by and large capital funding has to be routed through uh, city agencies to be performed improvements on city property uh, including you know gardens that are under parks's jurisdiction um, and so that's that's what capital dollars and then on the expense side it's a little bit, you know, more of it, you know, the dollar figures are significantly lower, but there's a lot more flexibility in terms of what that can cover. That can be, it could fund anything ranging from, you know, rakes and shovels to actual staff lines to, you know, a, plan, a, a contract with a planning uh, study consultant to do some sort of sweeping, you know, citywide analysis of, I don't know, whatever, I'm making it up, but right, like it's, it's you know, expertise or, you know, anything that's sort of not capitally eligible is essentially, you know, uh, is you know expense funding. So, and, and in fact, theoretically, you could use expense funding to rebuild an entire park or playground or garden, but you would be ill-advised because expense funding is sort of more more precious in a sense. Like the dollar figures are lower, but because there's so much flexibility, you really want to use capital money for capital projects and use expense funding for everything else, if that makes any sense. So, uh, specific to your question, you mentioned soft costs. So, in in our world, uh, soft costs are you know, costs that are related to a capital project, but outside of construction. So design consulting, uh, you know, uh, we usually keep some, you know, other uh, contingency funding and, you know, we consider that the soft cost of a, and, and, and unfortunately, soft costs are essentially included in a capital project budget and the whole of it is, is encompassed by capital dollars. Um, I suppose theoretically you could meld expense funding to cover some of those things on it, but I, I, I don't see a feasible way to do that. Um, that would get awfully complicated just because the capital budget funding, as I mentioned, is bond funded. So every expenditure, every, you know, so when a designer sits down and designs like a new water uh, system for a garden, for example, they have to actually like credit those billable hours. I know we're not, you know, we're not in the private world, but in, in essence they do. Our designers actually have to credit their design time towards that project budget line because everything's bond funded and has to draw down from that specific project. So, so the broader answer is expense discussion expense funding can be used for a huge variety of things, but in terms of expenses that are related to a capital project, 
by and large, those expenses need to be handled by discretionary capital funding. I hope that answered the question. But feel free to you know chime in or hit me you know, email. I'm always happy to talk uh, offline or whatever. Um, so if the person who has who asked that question has any follow ups, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, but my colleague Adder has another question for the panel. Hi. Yes, I received a question via a DM, and I'm going to throw this out to any of the panelists. But the question is: Can several gardens coordinate projects to bring costs up? to that minimum level for capital or expense. Right, this is where this is where the comprehensive betterment comes into play and the short answer is not really. So that yes it is true that uh, you know there is a $50,000 threshold but generally speaking because it has to constitute a comprehensive betterment at a given point in space and time um, that it usually has to be at one location. So you can't just, there are some exceptions that I, I won't bore you. Technically speaking, tree planting is considered a comprehensive betterment because it is like the city's, you know, tree canopy is considered like one piece of infrastructure. So that's a little, tree. but that aside, generally speaking, you can't just cobble together sites to get above the $50,000 threshold. It, it has to constitute a comprehensive betterment at a given location, generally speaking. And actually, uh, there's been a clarification on the question uh, in the chat. Uh, regarding more related more to like operational expenses, uh, 501c3 filing costs. Uh, so, so this would, in this case, if, if you're a garden that's not on city property, if you're sort of an external garden that's just in partnership with Green, Green Thumb, and if you are eligible to receive discretionary expense funding from the, uh, from the council, you can use that funding on a variety of different things. I'm not sure about administrative filing costs you know, to like maintain 501c3 status. That's that you're that's getting, I think we'd have to get to council and ask about like, I think they have certain parameters on what, you know, it can be used on salaries to a degree. I think they have a, I want to say it's a 30%, no, it's a 10% cap on indirect costs, like administrative, you know, salaries, things of that nature. Most of the discretionary expense funding that they provide to third parties are expected to be sort of like outward public facing, either programming or supplies, sort of more direct. Okay, so you are on city property. So in that case, you as a garden group, actually, I this gets a little tricky. I'll have to maybe consult with some of our colleagues. I, if you're eligible to receive funding, you can certainly receive funding that helps support programming and activities on a city garden. You just couldn't use it. So yes, I mean, you could use it to administrative benefits to some degree, but there is the, the council institutes, I believe it's a 10% cap. Only 10% of their award is allowed to be used on what they call indirect or administrative uh, benefits. Like most of their awards, they want to see in the form of, you know, a volunteer day or a garden day. And, and that, to be completely frank, there are groups that kind of ensconce a lot of their like back of house costs within that award, you know what I mean? It's kind of, but just, but the outward sort of shell of it is sort of a public program or an event or an ongoing sort of, you know, initiative or, or, or program or what have you. I hope that makes sense. This is, this one sounds a little nuanced, so I'm happy to talk offline. And this is more about strategy. Uh, you know, I, I, we do have some garden groups that do get awards that, you know, that are primarily on parks property, you know, but there's another realm in which funding could also come directly to the agency to provide those same benefits. So it's a little bit of a, a uh, little bit of a gray zone, but I'm, I'll throw my email in the in the in the chat. Feel free to hit me up. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, and are there any other questions? I don't see any other questions in the chat. Do folks have more? Brown also, I don't want to put Mara, I don't want to, like, we also, there is a Green Thumb, so I, we work closely with Green Thumb, actually, in, in addition to all the outreach coordinators who work with the individual garden groups and, and stewards. Uh, there, They also, there is a, and I can't remember who the staff liaison is right now, but there is a Green Thumb staffer that's assigned to helping shepherd through some of these third-party awards that go to garden-related groups, so we might want to bring them into the conversation as well. So Mara, I don't know if you happen to know offhand who that is these days. I haven't, I think we're supposed to be really, like, you know, connecting in a while but it's been a, it's been a couple of months so there may have been change over yeah no we we've definitely been shifting roles here at green thumb um folks can email me directly to be connected and i will put my i mean you guys always get emails from me 
<laughs> oh my God, great question. When is part two? Thanks for the reminder. We do have a part two. It's going to be in December. It's going to be in person. Um, and Sarah and I are going to be hosting kind of like workshoppy office hours where you can actually come in with proposals to workshop with the rest of the group. So if you want to go through your plan for advocating for discretionary funding, if you want to go through, uh, if you want to practice your pitch, um, like verbally, if you were to like talk to um, staff at elected officials offices, or if you actually have like written proposal language that you want um, us to look through, then that's going to be um, that's going to be that workshop. We don't have it on Eventbrite yet, um, but that's on the to-do list. And I will send out a link to everyone who attended here once we have that up. There's a question about when the portal opens for FY24. Um, I know the deadline is usually February 23. When I looked in the past, they usually announce it in like December. Does that sound right? Yeah, December, early January usually. So there's like a month or two long window. That's my understanding. Um, I also think it's different in years where there's a whole new council um, and where the speaker hasn't carried over. So right. this past year it opened late um, uh, because the election's in 2021. Um, and there will be, so, so folks know, um, because of the way the census rolls every 20 years, this council has two two-year terms followed by a four-year term rather than two can be back to back consecutive four year terms. So there was elections in 2021 for council, will be elections in 2023 for council, and then again in 2025, but that one will be for a four year term. Um, so there could be a lot of shifting uh, between now and then. Uh, and the council districts will be changing. So you actually may, even if you your current council member is able to run for reelection and is reelected again, they may not actually be your council member come uh, next year because the council will be changing its district lines um, going forward, just as you think about relationship planning about uh, who and when you might want to walk out, reach out to. Um, I will say particularly candidates are always very interested in getting a chance, coming to an event and getting a chance to shake some hands. Eric, it looks like we have another question. Yes, indeed we do. And uh, this next question is coming from uh, Sarah. And uh, Sarah's question is, if my community garden um, would like to host a mushroom planting workshop, will the costs for the um, mulch, spores, et cetera, be um, uh, taken care of? Um, that's, if you, I, I guess, would that be something that, like, if, for for example, if someone, if a community garden in one of the districts where Green Gorillas has discretionary funding um, came, came to, came to me, emailed me, gave me a call and was like, we would like to um, hold a mushroom planting workshop you know, uh, could you assist us with the supplies that are needed for that? Um, you know, if, if we had the funding left, you know, in and we're able to do that, I would say, yes, what do you need? You know, can you, is there a company that you, where you like to get mushroom kits from, or we could go various places to get spores and, you know, um, like there are a few different options for um, getting all of that done. But then, let's say Green Gorillas did pay for all of those things, I would keep all of the receipts from all of those things, write down exactly what they were used for, write down information about the event, so that then at the end of the fiscal year, when I put together my reimbursement packet for the city and share that back out, I would say, these kits were purchased for such and such garden in district, such and such, and you know, it was to support this particular event, et cetera. So, um, you know, so that's an example of like when you're working with a nonprofit organization that has discretionary, you know, something like that is is usually like a small amount of, of funds, you know, that might take a couple hundred dollars to do. So that wouldn't really make sense to like be a, its own discretionary ask, in other words, 
but if you're working with like someone who has a larger pot of discretionary funds they you know could be willing to um wrap that into uh you know the funding that they already have i don't know if that's terribly helpful um no, that was great. And thank you so much for that. I think like this sense of scale is important and timing. And um, someone shared in the chat, we actually have a mushroom production workshop tomorrow in Harlem. Um, it had, was rescheduled from last week because of the rain last week. Um, and we're really excited about it. This is also the kind of thing that you can request from Green Thumb. So this is why it's really nice to talk to your outreach coordinator first, because sometimes you don't even have to get external funding. Green Thumb can um, partner with you on that. And so we plan our workshop series six to nine months in advance. Um, spring is like almost done. Um, but if folks on this call are interested in hosting Green Thumb workshops next summer, June, July, August, um, then please reach out to me. We're going to be starting to plan that soon. Um, and we love doing mushrooms workshops. And then Green Thumb covers the costs. And you don't even have to worry about it. We just like ask you to host and open the gates and access your seating. And if you have tables, great. Um, share a few words about the garden, help us spread word amongst members and the surrounding community, that kind of thing. Um, so we're always open to, to partnering on workshops. And I think that is it. I think that was our last question. I really wanna thank our panelists. Thank you so much, Sarah, Matt, uh, Robert. Thank you to my colleagues, Eric and Adder. And thank you all of you for joining us. Um, so many community gardens from across the city who are always looking to improve their sites. We're really grateful and really inspired by all the work that you do. Um, I will uh, share this link later on this week to the recording. And so you can review if you've missed anything. There's a lot of details. Um, thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.